Well, thank you, thank you, Cyril. Hi, everyone. Welcome back for those of you who are already there on, on Monday, and so welcome for the others. So, my name is Bruno Federici. I'm a physicist by training. I'm here, um, I work here in France. So, now I'm a freelance consultant. So, my job is to explain quantum computing and quantum technologies to companies for them to start understanding what's going on with, uh, with those technologies and what they can do with it uh, for their business. So this is one part of my job. And the second part of my job is to teach at the university and in engineering school department here in France. So on Monday, we gave a brief introduction of quantum computing by presenting a collection of potential use cases. We also discussed the notion of quantum speed up. We introduced the notion of quantum superposition and quantum entanglement as well. And so finally, we have been able to study a first quantum algorithm, namely the Gruber's algorithms for searching in an uncertain database. So today you will have the opportunity to code your first program as we will explore the quantum software environment. So I will first, uh, pres I will first present a few software platforms, including Microsoft Azure, AWS Quantum, and, and so on. Then I will, will go more in depth into the IBM quantum experience uh, cloud solutions. We will introduce Qiskit, which is a Python library for coding quantum algorithms and execute them on the, running them on the, on, quantum, on actual quantum processors and simulators. And so we will go through a live coding session for the main part of the talk of today. Uh, yeah, if you have any question, please write them into the, into the chat. And so Terry will, uh, will read them so I can answer. So I, I will review a few, a few platforms. So the first one I wanted to mention, maybe I will go in full screen. So it's easier for you to, to follow. I hope it's uh, big enough for you to read. So the, the first solution I wanted to, to mention is the one from, AW, uh, from Amazon Web Service, Web Service. It's called Amazon Bracket. You can find it uh, online uh, really easily. At the moment, it's just for uh, it's just for people at the university and for uh, quantum computing experts. But they will open it soon to to everybody, I guess. But you can sign up for for a preview. What I wanted to to show you is the graphical user interface that is proposed by uh, by Amazon. Hey Bruno. So the Bruno. Yeah. Can I interrupt you for one second? Because you brought up a really good topic, uh, uh, AWS. Uh, just quickly, folks, if I can inject this, because it's a really good opportunity. Um, uh, Microsoft Azure just announced uh, a quantum developer workshop. Uh, so as many of you may or may not know, AWS is, is opening up quantum to the cloud, hopefully by the end of this year. And Microsoft Azure is doing the same thing. There's a- We go to Microsoft after a while. Okay. Uh, but there's a, a, a workshop on uh, July 16th. Check out the uh, Quantum of Palooza page for July 16th, and it's got the details. Sorry about that, and it's all yours again. All right, thanks, David, for the information. Uh, I should register, I guess. So when going on the AWS uh, at the AWS platform, you have the choice in between running a quantum algorithms or an hybrid quantum classical algorithm. So I will explain a little bit more what does it mean as I didn't introduce the hybrid quantum classical algorithm uh, formalism before. I will go more in depth with that uh, on Friday, but I want to, to say a few words. Uh, so just before, when you want to run a quantum algorithm like the Shor algorithm or the Groover's algorithm that we mentioned on Monday, you have either the choice to, to run it on a classical simulator so you can simulate something like, I guess, up to 30 or maybe 40 quantum bits. And, uh, or, so this is, a, this is a great opportunity to, to debug your code, to see what's going on step by step without waiting for in a queue to, to run on a quantum hardware. And then when the code is ready for execution, you can then run it on an actual quantum processor. So uh, just to let you know, uh, Amazon is not proposing its own hardware. It's the hardware from partners. So they are partnering with companies like, uh, where is it written here? 
like Rigetti. Rigetti is proposing superconducting uh, quantum processors, superconducting qubits. I will uh, explain uh, more on Friday uh, on what, how is it actually working. So Rigetti, it's the same technology as, uh, more or less the same technology as Google or IBM. Ion queues are proposing another approach uh, based on trapped ions in, a, in an optical trap, electromagnetic trap. So you are playing with uh, the energy levels of ions. Uh, Rigetti and Ion Q, it's for uh, quantum circuit executions. So the, the approach of quantum computing that I, that I presented on, on Monday, so the quantum circuit. Uh, and you also have D-Wave as, um, as, as as backend. So D-Wave is not exactly the same technology as Rigetti or Ion Q, uh, not the same approach, I mean. Uh, with D-Wave, it's more an, an adiabatic quantum computing approach. Uh, which is not really proven to be faster than the classical approach. So I, I don't really want to detail what's going on with D-Wave. Uh, I prefer to speak about the quantum circuit approach because you can do universal quantum computation with it. So you have different backends, superconducting qubits, high on uh, trapped ions. Both of them have um, pros and cons that I will, uh, more, details on, on, that I will more detail on, on Friday. So you can pick one of them and execute your, your quantum algorithm on one of those two uh, on one of those two backends, or even on the D-wave on the D-wave uh, backend. So this is to execute a quantum algorithm with, with a non-parametric circuit, which is the actual difference with what we call an hybrid quantum classical algorithm. What what they call a quantum algorithm is an algorithm with all the gates with fixed parameters, like the X gate with 0, 1, 1, 0, or the Adamar gate, everything, is, fi everything is, uh, is set in the gate. You cannot tune the parameters. You cannot tune the coefficients of the gate. So this is what I call the param non-parametric quantum circuit. So for running it, you need, uh, you need a really good processors uh, because with the noise, you will accumulate noise step by step when running the algorithm gate after gate. So most of the so most of the quantum algorithms that are par non-parametric will not it will not be possible to run them on actual quantum hardware in the few coming in the few coming years. So a, a second approach that is possible to solve some interesting problems in in the in the next years is to go to hybrid quantum classical algorithms. So this title means that some gates into the quantum circuits can be parametrized, like, the, ang like uh, the angle in a rotation gate or, or something like this. So the basic idea is more like, it's more like neural networks and machine learning. You have a cost function that you want to, to minimize, for instance, or to maximize. And so a classical, a classical processor, so a CPU, will propose a distribution of the parameters for the, the quantum circuit. It will then execute the quantum circuits through the quantum processors, which is the hard part of the computation. And you will check the value of the cost function. If it's better than before, then you will continue to turn the parameters in the same direction. And then you will execute again the algorithm on the quantum processors and so on and so on and so on. It's a feedback loop. And at some point when the cost function is low enough, when the value of the cost function is, is satisfying, then you stop the process and you have the solution. So that's the way it works. And with this kind of approach, we expect uh, a better resistance uh, to noise. Of course, the performances won't be as good as with Shor's algorithm or maybe even Groover's algorithm, because you need uh, many iterations in between the CPU and the PPU. And this is, can be really costly in terms of time. So don't expect better, better or same performances as with full quantum, with full quantum approach. But still, maybe you will win, I don't know, maybe 10% or 20% or even 30% of the, on the speed of a computation. And maybe even more important, uh, I wish this would be more accurate than the classical counterpart. So that's the, the way it works with Amazon Web Services. So it's pretty, I won't say pretty simple, but uh, it's pretty well presented, I think. Uh, then you can find more or less the same thing with uh, another provider. His name is QCWare. QCWare, uh, QCWare is a company in, uh, in California. And so they have developed a new platform called QCWare Forge. So it's more or less the same thing as with, uh, with Amazon Web Service. 
Uh, okay. So you can, if you remember what I said on Monday, I said that some problems are optimization problems, some of them are simulations problems, some of them are machine learning problems. I said predictions on Monday. So you can um, you can specify with um, what what kind of problems that you, you you want to target through the the algorithm step. You can as well specify some uh, hardware. I mean, with the algorithms, you can access a library of, uh, of predefined algorithms for machine learning, optimization on graphs, and uh, simulation of, of energy levels of molecules, for instance. So you pick one of them. And then you can compare the performances of your circuits on, a, for instance, uh, for instance, of the super, uh, superconducting uh, quantum processors, like the ones of IBM or Rigetti that are partners of uh, QCWare. You can also execute it as with AWS on a classical simulators for small circuits of up to 30 or maybe 40, 40 qubits on IBM, on Google, Rigetti, but also Microsoft. Uh, and as well, you can also access on uh, what, I, what I called before the, the adiabatic approach or the annealing approach, which is a, on a second name for, for this. You will also find more or less the same thing with Microsoft, uh, the, Azure, the Azure Quantum that, uh, that Terry mentioned before. So it's more or less the same ID. You can, uh, you can access different backends. So the one from Microsoft, maybe not now, but in a, maybe in a close future. So Microsoft is working on an approach called uh, topological qubits. Uh, it's supposed to be more robust to noise than the other approach. I, I will say words on it uh, on Friday. You can access IonQ and Honeywell. There are two, uh, two companies working on, on a trapped ions quantum processors, processors that are less noisy, but with less, uh, with, uh, with a less interesting number of, uh, of operations per second. So the price to pay, it's more protected, but it's, uh, it's less fast. And you can also access the superconducting devices of QC, QCI, which is another company. Yeah, you have uh, you can code in Q Sharp. Q Sharp is uh, is a library developed by Microsoft to to, to code quantum circuits. Uh, Microsoft is working in close collaboration with OneQubit, which is a Canadian company with expertise in quantum quantum algorithms. So if you're a company, you can call Microsoft, then you will work with Microsoft and OneQubit on defining uh, interesting algorithms for your business. And then you can also access uh, to simulators as well as before. And so you can target optimization problem, prediction problems, and quantum simulation problems as I, as I uh, mentioned uh, on Monday. So this is for uh, Azure Quantum. Uh, maybe another one I can mention is, uh, is a new platform that has been developed uh, here in Europe uh, by uh, TU Delft, Technical University of Delft, and QTech, which is uh, the, labor the laboratory specialized in quantum technologies in inside this university. So they have developed a quantum inspired platform. The idea is, uh, is more or less the same as before. So you can code your algorithms with, uh, I think, in Python. Here you can uh, you can see the circuit that you are coding. You will see that we, we will do the same in, uh, with Qiskit with IBM uh, later in the in the talk of today. And so you can execute it on uh, different other, other platforms like superconducting or uh, spin qubit in silicon or or other things. And TU Delft is working in close collaboration with uh, if I don't say mistake with uh, with Intel. Another company is uh, Zapata. Zapata is an American company. They have expertise in quantum, uh, in quantum algorithms. So they have developed a new platform that they launched uh, earlier this month called Orchestra. So with Orchestra, you can, uh, you can code a quantum algorithm either with CIRC. CIRC is a Python library from Google or Qiskit, the library from IBM. Uh, for uh, for simulating molecule, you can access also. You can write uh, you can write your programs with Open Fermion. Open Fermion in, uh, is a library for uh, the structures of molecules to to access the, the orbitals of molecules to to execute uh, algorithms specialized in simulating the energy of uh, of molecules. You can also access penny lanes that I will 
present more in depth after afterwards. Pinyline is a library from the company Xanadu. Xanadu is based, uh, the headquarters is in Toronto in, in Canada. And so Penny Lane is a library speciali specialized for machine learning and uh, quantum neural networks. You also have access to, to PyQuill. PyQuill is, uh, is a Python library from Rigetti, so for uh, superconducting circuits. You also have access to, to QSharp from Microsoft. And so you can then target uh, problems from machine learning, from chemistry, from finance, from uh, optimization uh, more broadly. Uh, and you can also interface with uh, some uh, classical solutions like Scikit-Learn, which is a machine learning library developed by people uh, at INRIA here, INRIA here in France. INRIA is, uh, is a laboratory specialized in, uh, in applied, uh, in applied uh, computing. So they have developed Scikit-Learn for classical machine learning. You can also interface with TensorFlow, which is the, I think the world leading platform with PyTorch for uh, for deep learning implementation and some other tools from chemistry from finance and so on and so then you can uh, you can target different hardware as, as well so superconducting qubits photonic qubits uh, maybe the ones from xanadu i guess uh, and also uh, trapped ions quantum processors uh, like maybe the ones from ion q or or aqt uh, i don't know where are the partners you can also execute on annulars, I mean adiabatic quantum computing, and uh, as well on classical simulators. And so then you have some uh, some nice tools to visualize your result, to analyze to analyze everything. And, and so the end that's it. So this is for for Zapata. What else? Uh, I quickly wanted to to mention uh, not a platform but a library which is called TensorFlow Quantum. I just mentioned TensorFlow. But TensorFlow Quantum is, a, is an evolution of TensorFlow to, to, to mix CIRC, which is a, the Python library from Google, with TensorFlow, the library from Google for, for neural networks. So with TensorFlow Quantum, you can easily map a quantum circuit into a tensor, ten, a tensor representation. That is uh, the, use, the usual way to represent a, a neural network with TensorFlow. So it's a, it's a new tool from... Uh, from beginning of 2020, they introduced it um, maybe in, Mar in March. So it's pretty new. You have, uh, if you want to play, you have many tutorials on the TensorFlow Quantum uh, platforms. It's, I won't say it's pretty easy, but the tutorials are pretty well written, so it's easy to, to follow. So you can start learning how to, to map a quantum, a quantum neural, uh, a neural network onto a quantum circuit. Uh, what else? Okay, so another library is Penny Lane. Penny Lane is more or less the same thing as TensorFlow Quantum, uh, but it's developed by Xanadu, the, the Canadian company that I earlier mentioned. You have many tutorials as well. Uh, I'd like to access here. Uh, you can also have a look of uh, Forest. Forest is uh, an SDK, a software development kit with the library called PyKill. It's the one from Rigetti. So you can code, uh, you can code your quantum, on code, you can program your quantum circuit, and then you can execute it on the Rigetti hardware, so superconducting qubits. Uh, so here, for instance, you have uh, three processors: the Aspen Four, the Gave, and the Acorn with some uh, specifications um, like the T1 coherence time or the average gate fidelity and so on. Okay, so now I wanted to, to go more in depth with the IBM quantum experience. So if you have a Firefox or a Google Chrome uh, Windows op window open, you, you, can, uh, you can access and do the same things uh, that I will do. So when you open uh, IBM Quantum Experience, which is a cloud platform from IBM for, uh, for, for the quantum computing stuff, maybe some of you uh, got familiar with it because of the quantum challenge uh, of last week, the IBM Quantum Challenge. So when you arrive on the platform, the first thing to do is to, is to log in. So you can log in with Google, with, uh, with uh, LinkedIn or whatever you want. So I will log in with Google. Terrell, do you have any question at this point? Hold on one second. 
No question? No, I don't think so. I think we're good. Okay, all right. So when you open IBM Quantum Experience, we arrive on something like this. So what can I say? So first, first thing first, uh, about the backends. IBM is providing something like 10 or 15 uh, quantum processors with like five to, to 15 qubits for the for everybody. If you're a company, maybe you can ask for, you can request for access to uh, 50, 50 qubit quantum processors, which is based in, uh, which is located in Tokyo. So when opening the, the quantum experience platform on the right hand side of, uh, of the window, you will see the different uh, available backends that you can access for executing uh, algorithms. So see, for instance, uh, the first one, the one based in, uh, in Australia. Maybe we have the Australian guy from Monday. So when opening the, the, the QPU uh, specification uh, page, so what you can see first is the architecture of the processor. So, so you have here 15 processor in a grid configuration numbered from uh, 0 to, to 14. And so as you can see on the left, you have the, the number of jobs that are uh, that are executed at the moment. So 12 jobs are, are pending. You can execute only one by one, of course. So there's a, a queue system, a ticket system for for accessing the, the hardware. So it's not uh, it's not immediate. Sometimes it can be quite long. Even, uh, even hours in the worst case scenario. So you have access to the, to the, the processor architecture and you have a, a color map. The color map, I will say more on, on Friday, but the color map is associated to the fidelity of the quantum operation that you will implement. So when you want to, when you want to do universal quantum computation, the only thing that you need is what we call a CNOT gate that I earlier introduced on Monday. So as a, women, as, a, as a reminder, a CNN gate take a, a control qubit and a target qubit. If the control qubit is in the zero state, then the target qubit is left in, the, in, the, in, the, in its state. But if the control qubit is in state one, then you have to flip the, the target qubit. So this is a CNOT. And so with a CNOT and a few one single qubit gates, like for instance the X gate or the H gate um, and, so, and some others, with the CNOT and few single qubit gates, uh, you can you can do what we call the universal quantum computation. It means that you can you can do whatever you want. You you can comp you can compile anything. You can compile anything. So here you have the, the what we call the fidelity of uh, of the CNOT operation. Uh, it's not really the fidelity. It's it's the opposite. It's the error rate the rate of errors that you have when implementing a single uh, CNOT gate. So as you can see on some processors, it's better than on some other, on a, sorry, on some qubits, it's better than on some others. So the fidelity of the CNOT gate is represented by the, by the vertical and the horizontal uh, lines because it's a two qubit gate. They have to, the gate has to link to two qubits. So that's why it's a, it's a link here. So as you can see, it's, uh, the performance is actually is actually better in between qubit zero and one than on qubit uh, fourteen and thirteen. And here you have the same color map, but not for two qubit gates, not for the CNOT, but for a gate that you call that we call a U two, the U two gate. Uh, I won't detail it. I won't detail what what is a U two gate, but uh, it's a single qubit gate. And so as before. Uh, the single qubit gate uh, error rate is represented by the color of the circle for each qubit. So as you can see, the, the, the qubit number zero perform better than the qubit number four, for instance. Or the opposite, sorry. Uh, no, it's what I said. Yeah, so qubit number zero is better than the qubit number four. Yeah, and so here you have what I call the basis gate. So everything is, deco is, uh, is decomposed at some point into identity gates, U1, U2, U3, and the controller X gates, which, which I call the, the CNOT gate. So when you implement, for instance, the X gate or Adamar gate or anything else, everything will be, compu will be compiled into, uh, into identity U1, U2, U3, and uh, control X before to be, to be given to, to the processor. So when you implement maybe 20 gates, 
in the end, maybe two or three gates will be actually implemented, physically speaking. So this is uh, the map of the of the processors. Uh, this is uh, the, the the biggest one that you can access. Uh, oh, here I can see this one is new, or pretty new. Uh, it's a new it's a new processor that is based in uh, in Roma in Italy, I, I guess. So here is the architecture. It's it's a chain. It's a one dimensional chain with uh, with five qubits, uh, ten basis gates, and uh, the same color map as before. You also have access to the, the last calibration update that has been done uh, today, uh, earlier in the afternoon, French time. And so on and so on. Everything here are quantum processors, actual quantum processors, except the last one. The last one is not a QPU, not a quantum process unit, but a classical, uh, but a classical process unit. So it's called the Kazam simulator. It's a classical, uh, it's a classical uh, processors, and with it you can simulate up to 32 qubits. So not really big, uh, really big algorithms, but still you can simulate up to uh, 32 quantum registers with it. And it's much more faster to execute the code on the on the classical simulator, of course, than on the quantum ones, on the quantum processors. So then, uh, when you want to, to start playing, you have two, two possibilities. I will detail both of them. I will detail both, both, of them, both of them. So the first one is what they call the circuit composer, which is a, a graphical user interface. So we will open it. So when open it, the graphical user interface, the circuit composer, you have to, to build a new circuit, of course. So let's click on new circuits here. You, you can do it on your own. So I just open it and this is the, the environment that is proposed to me. So as you can see, it's, uh, it's like a drop and uh, it's just dropping the gate and put it on the circuit. So for instance, what we can do as a, as a Hello Quantum, uh, Hello Quantum circuit, if you remember what I said uh, on Monday, I said that if you want to generate an entangled state, like for instance, 0, 0, plus 1, 1 on square root of 2, so let's just say a 0, 0, plus 1, 1, which is an entangled state. If you measure 0 on the first subsystem, then you know that the second one is in state 0. If you measure 1 on the first subsystem, you know that the second one is in state 1. So if you want to generate a 0, 0, plus 1, 1, uh, 2 qubit state, you have to, to combine a edge gate, a Hadamard gate on the first qubit, and then a control node gate with the control on the first qubit and the target on the second qubit. So I didn't say, but when opening uh, the circuit composer, everything is initialized in the zero state. So it's just a classical bit at the beginning. All registers here, all the quantum registers that you have, here you have five registers from zero to four everything is initialized in the zero state. So first thing first, you go on the first register from zero to zero plus one on, zero, on square root of two, which is uh, the action of the eight gate. And then because you enter with a superposed state onto the first registers, yeah, then you will end up after the C node gate, after the control X gate, you will end up with zero zero plus one one, which is the, the entangled state that I mentioned. So you will end up with an entangled state after executing those two gates. So with this, you are uh, you are pretty happy, but it's not the end of the story. After that, you need, of course, to measure your quantum circuits to sample in between zero zero and one one. So I put two measurement operators here, and so uh, the lines, the vertical lines here means that the first qubit will be measured on the classical, uh, the, 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 the results of the measurement on the first qubit will be accessed on the first classical register. And the, measure, and the measurement results on the second qubit will be accessed on the, on the first classical register here. So with that, we are happy. So we can now execute the circuit. So before to execute it, you first have to, to save it. So that's it. And then you can click on the run button. So when I click on run, 
you have to specify a, a backend for execution. And as you can see here, you only have uh, five, uh, five tokens, I don't know, maybe per day or per hour, or something like this. So it's not uh, unlimited access, but you can specify one of the available backend. So for instance, you can maybe specify the Kazam simulator, so the classical simulator. You can specify the quantum processors of 15 qubits based in, uh, located in Melbourne, in Australia. You can specify the one in Vigo in Spain, the one in London, the one in Burlington, and so on, depending on, uh, on the size of the quantum circuit. Maybe it's not, uh, it's not necessary to run on a 15 qubit processors, but maybe only on a five qubit processor. Maybe it's enough. So before to run on an actual quantum processor, I first want to show you what happened when running on, on, on the simulator. So I will specify the simulator. And if you remember well what I said on Monday, I told you that when you, you, measure, you measure a quantum circuit with an output state that is a, a superposition of state, the only thing that you, will, that you will get as a result is one on the different possibilities, one of the different uh, uh, vector, one of the different uh, combination of zero and one of your superposition. So for instance, if I run my, my, my quantum circuit only one time with the entangled state that I prepared earlier, maybe I will get zero, zero, or maybe I will get one, one, and both of them with a 50% chance. So if I run the quantum circuit only one time, I will get maybe zero, zero, or maybe one, one with the same chance. So if you want to access to the distribution, if you want to know what is the ratio of your state in between, inside your state in between one, one and zero, zero, you have to prepare the state many times and so to measure it many times. So we will repeat the experiment, maybe 1000 times or maybe 4000 times to, to have a better uh, statistical signif signification. So let's go for 4,000 times, but you can also specify uh, 8,000 times. So let's go for four. So let's run the, the quantum circuit. So after clicking on run, then the execution is, is, uh, is summarized here. So the result was pending and now it has been executed. So you can access the results. So as you can see, it's, it was pretty fast. So let's open the, the results. Uh, so first on the left here you have the original circuit that you have uh, that you have prepared and here on the right as you can see is the same circuit but this is what is called the, the transpiled the, the transpiled circuit in our case as the circuit was pretty simple the transpiled circuit is actually the same but it might be the case that you want to implement for instance a control uh, a synod gate in between two qubits that are not nearest neighbors on the chip. So as they are not nearest neighbors on the chip, then you cannot execute a control, a control node execution directly in between, the, in between them. So the transpile step, the transpile step will maybe interchange, will maybe, will maybe exchange some of the registers so for, your, so for your circuits to actually correspond to the physics of the chip. So this is the, trans the transpilation step. So here it, it doesn't really matter, but in some case it can be, uh, it can be necessary, but you, you don't see it, it's, uh, it's hidden. It's hidden in the process. So this is the transpiling step, then the validation, then you go into the queue, you have to wait for, for some time, and then the circuit is actually running, running and so you can, uh, after this, you can access uh, the results. So the results are summarized at the end. So as you can see, as we expected, we got in um, almost 50% cases a zero zero configuration, a zero zero measurement. But also in 50% cases, we, act, we 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 got a one one a one one uh, one one results. Uh, so in IBM, the most significant bits are summarized on the right of the on the right side of the writing. So the first three zero 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 here refers to qubit two, qubit three, and qubit four that we didn't uh, we didn't use. So the only ones that matter are the one uh, on the right side. So it's zero, zero here and one, one here. So this is what, uh, what we expected. So we are happy with that so far. So let's come back to the, uh, to the previous circuit. 
where is it? Uh, I guess it's this one. Uh, before running the, the, the circuit onto the quantum processors, uh, I wanted to, to mention a uh, few other tools. So here on the right, you have a, a menu that is called settings. So with settings, you can, uh, sorry, it's not the good window. The good window is this one, sorry. So you can access, you can go to the settings menu. So with the settings menu, you can specify the number of quantum registers, and that is the number of quantum bits that you want to work with. So here by default, by default it's five, but you can turn it uh, on to two, for instance, as we work with only two registers. Uh, so this is, this is a, a degree of freedom that you can play with. Then you have what they call the circuit editor. So the circuit editor uh, gives you access to what they call the open the the Kazam uh, the Kazam code. So the open Kazam is not uh, Python code as we will uh, write later with Qiskit, but it's uh, it's a lower level uh, code uh, to give uh, to give instructions then to the to the quantum processor. So it's a lower it's a lower level uh, instruction level uh, instruction uh, instruction set. So here you can see that we initialize a two qubit circuit. With, uh, we initialize a circuit with two quantum registers, two classical registers. We, we implemented a Hanamar gate on the first uh, quantum bit and a control X gate, that is a, con a control node gate, with the, with the, with the, the, with the control qubit as uh, qubit zero and the target qubit as qubit number one. And then we map qubit zero with classical register zero and qubit one to classical register one as, uh, as it's summarized on, on the right with, with the circuit. Then maybe more interesting, you have a new tool that they, they introduced a few, few weeks ago. It's a, visualization, it's a visualization menu. So you can see different thing here. The first thing that you can visualize it is the state vector step by step. So after each gate that you, you drop onto the circuit, you can see what happened to the state vector. So here, for instance, after an edge gate and a control node gate, the state vector is a perfect superposition uh, of 0, 0, and 1, 1. Here it's not uh, 0 0.5, not 0 0.5 because it's not the probability that you are looking at. It's not the square root modulus of the, of the coefficient, but it's the coefficient itself. Remember, in the quantum and quantum computing, we are not working with stochastic vector, with classical mixtures, with classical probabilities, but we are working with amplitude probabilities that are complex numbers. So here you can visualize the value of the coefficients into the superposition that are complex numbers. So here the, the bar is, uh, is the amplitude of the state and the color of the, of the bar of the, of the bar is actually the phase, the complex phase of the phase. So here, for instance, the color is blue, which means that the phase of the coefficients, the local phase of the, of the, of the quantum state is zero. That is, you are working with real value, not complex value. But in the, in the general case, you can work with complex numbers in quantum computing. So you have to keep it in mind. So this is the state vector. So you can visualize what happened to the state step by step. And then you can also access to the measurement probabilities. So the square root, uh, sorry, so the, so the modulus square of the probability amplitude. So this is directly the probabilities. That is the, the stochastic uh, vectors, if I can say it like this. So this is uh, the sampling, the, the classical distribution after many, many measurements that you can expect. It's not the result of the measurement, but this is what you can expect. And they also provide a more advanced tool that I won't, I won't really detail, but I want to mention briefly, is the density matrix. The density matrix is a much more advanced uh, quantum computing tool. Usually you see it uh, on second year of quantum computing lecture. So just to say something, the density matrix uh, present, uh, is presented the following way. So the density matrix, the diagonal elements of the density matrix tell you, uh, tells, you, uh, tells you the proportion of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 inside the superposition. 
So here we expect the same amount of 1, 1 and 0, 0, the same ratio, I mean in between 0, 0 and 1, 1. So that's why the, the diagonal elements 0, 0 and 1, 1 have the same amplitude into the density matrix. And more interesting, the off diagonal elements of the density matrix. If I tell you that I prepared a quantum superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1, that is an entangled state. How, how do you make the difference in between a processor that will generate an entangled state, that is 0, 0 plus 1, 1, and a fake processor, let's say, that generates in half of the cases a 0, 0, and in half of the cases a 1, 1. That is a statistical mixture, a classical mixture of 0, 0 and 1, 1. Generating uh, half of the time 0, 0 and half of the time 1, 1 is not at all the same as generating all the time, in all cases, a superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1. It's not at all the same thing. In, in one case, you have a quantum state. In the other case, you have a classical state. So the diagonal elements of the density matrix uh, it uh, can be helpful to distinguish in between these two, these, two these, these two cases. The off diagonal elements of the density matrix are called, the, are called coherence terms. The coherence terms tell you if, if it is a, a quantum superposition or not. As you can see here, as you can see here, there's a contribution of the off diagonal, of the, of the off -diagonal elements of the off diagonal terms of the density matrix. This means that the states that you were that you generated are an actual quantum superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1. It's an actual, it's an actual entangled state. It's not a fake uh, quantum processor. The processor is not generating one time 0, 0 and another time 1, 1. So the diagonal elements of the density matrix, we call them the populations because they give you the ratio, uh, the ratio of 0, 0 and 1, 1 in between 0, 0 and 1, 1. And the off diagonal terms, as I already said, they are called coherence because you can distinguish in between the quantum superposition, what we also call the coherence superposition. That's why we call it coherence term, terms. And a classical mixture of quantum state, which is not at all the same as handling an entangled state or superposition of quantum states, more generally speaking. Uh, Cyril, do we have any question at this time, at this point? No question. Wait a minute. Whoa, yeah. wait a second. One just popped in. Amir. Good. Okay. How come it shows the entangled states twice, the four corners? Uh, sorry, can you say it again? I'm not sure. Oh, that why, why, does it, why does it show the entangled states twice? Why do you mean by twice? Why, why, why the four corners again? Why the four corners again? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the density matrix is a product uh, in between your state and your state itself transpose, let's say. Uh, give me one minute. Uh, I just want to open another, another thing. While you're doing that, I'll add, you know, the density matrices are very, very important. And frankly, I've had, I'm fully aware of density matrix and social network analysis, but uh, uh, it's very important in um, error correction if I, if I understand it correctly. Yes, so it's, it's an important yeah, it, concept. It's a, tool, it's a tool to characterize what we call the incoherent noise. Uh, that is the interaction in between the processors and, and its environment. So uh, I don't know who's asking, but if you have some background in, uh, in linear algebra or quantum mechanics direct notation, uh, the density matrix, the mathematical expression of it is the following. So uh, P, Pi is a classical probability distribution. That is the, the, the mixture. So maybe sometimes you can generate uh, with 50% uh, with uh, chance, maybe state zero. And maybe you can also generate with 50% chance state one. So this is a classical probability. So you sum up on the, different on the different possible configurations that you can generate. So maybe you can generate one, maybe you can generate uh, zero, maybe you can generate zero plus one, and so on. And here on the right side, this is uh, the, the, the matrix, I would say itself, I mean, the, 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 the structure of a matrix. So you are multiplying uh, a column vector, that is your quantum state, 
So inside the quantum state, for instance, if you have generating an entangled state, so the first coefficient will be one over square root of two, the second coefficient will be zero, zero the third coefficient will be zero, and the fourth coefficient will be uh, one over square root of two. So this is a vector col a column vector of your quantum state for one given configuration. And the second notation that we call a bra vector is exactly the same thing, but the, uh, but the emission conjugate. That is uh, a line column, an horizontal vector with the same coefficient as the other one, except that you take the, the, complex, the, the complex conjugate. And so you multiply a column vector with a line vector. So at the end, you have a matrix. And so if you have a, a thing, if you generate only one state, which is what we expect from our processor from before, we expect a processor to generate only one sort of state, which is the entangled state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So we should expect in the density expression only one coefficient p, which is equal to 1, and that corresponds to the entangled state. All the other possible configuration are uh, with p equal to 0 because they are not represented. So if you multiply 1 over square root of 2, 0, 0, 0, 1 over square root of 2, the vector with the same as a line vector, the column vector with the line vector, you will end up with a matrix with four elements that are non-zero. Uh, non so you will end up with the coefficient 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, ket 0, 0, bra 0, 0, uh, ket 1, 1, bra 0, 0, so the off diagonal, the corner element on the top right, same with the bottom left, and you will end up also with the 1, 1, the 1, 1 uh, coefficient that is non-null uh, non uh, here. So that's, uh, that's why we have four coefficients in our cases. So the, off the diagonal elements are what we call the populations. So they are directly the value of the P, of PE. So uh, PI, sorry. So the first one is the probability of getting 0, 0. And the second one is the probability of getting 1, 1. So as you can see in an entangled state of 0, 0 plus 1, 1 over square root of 2, both of them are equal to, to, to 1 half. And, uh, and that is, and the other ones are for the 0011 and 1100. So I think that is for the density matrix. Do we have any other questions? Not sure that is very clear, but it's, it's, a, it's a really advanced concept. Any other question, Thierry? Terry, can you hear me? Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, guys. Uh, I just opened the chat. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, so it's just Terry. Okay, uh, do you have other question? Let me see. No, just the one on the density matrix. You can hear me from Australia. Awesome, amazing. Okay, so let's continue the, the explanation. So that is for the visualization. And the last, uh, the last menu is, uh, okay, is, uh, is a log file of uh, what happened before, so we don't care. Okay. So that is for the, the circuit composer. It's a nice way to, to learn what, what's going on uh, when executing a quantum circuit. So I would say this is for, uh, for beginners. And then if you want to start coding, you can access the second tool, which is the, the, the Jupyter Notebook environment for coding with Qiskit. So I guess you all know what is a Jupyter Notebook for, for coding. So I will, I will comment on, on Qiskit. Qiskit is a Python library that has been created, uh, that have been built by people at IBM, but uh, it's open source now. This is open source sourced it a few years ago. So Kis with Qiskit, you can, uh, you can code the quantum circuits. So it's, Python, it's, a, it's a Python library, so it's uh, object ori oriented. So inside Qiskit, you have uh, different li sub libraries. So for instance, you have Qiskit Terra that we will use today. So with Qiskit Terra, you can start uh, writing simple circuits. Then you have the Qiskit, uh, the second one, Qiskit ARR. 
uh, AUR. So with this one, uh, it's first uh, it's for accessing a simulator as backend, so it's handling uh, classical simulators. So you can also with this uh, with this framework, you can also simulate the noise that you have in a quantum in a actual quantum processor. So you don't need to to queue. Uh, you don't need to go into the queue to to run your program into a quantum processor. You can capture the noise model of a QPU and map it onto a classical CPU. And so you can reproduce the noise that you have inside a, uh, an actual quantum processors when running on a quantum, on a classical simulators. So you don't need to to wait for too long when uh, when running a simple algorithms with not too many qubits, of course. Uh, then you also have the Qiskit Aqua. Qiskit Aqua is is a is a library for domain specific uh, or for domain specific algorithms like uh, the ones for chemistry from simulating energy levels of molecules or the ones for optimization in, I don't know, in supply chain, or maybe algorithms for, for finance, for a risk estimation in finance, and so on and so on. And the last one uh, is Kiskit Ignis. Kiskit Ignis is a library for, uh, for playing with, uh, with noise, for characterizing your processor, like computing the, the fidelity of the gate, yeah, I'll, I'll like computing the, the coherence time of, the, of your quantum circuit, of your processors. Uh, and playing with some uh, error correction tools that I, uh, I won't detail today, of course, nor Friday, because it's, uh, it's a much more advanced uh, concept. And so the last one I didn't say, but it's the, the IBM Q provider, of course, to access uh, to access uh, the actual QPU that I presented before, like the one in Australia or the one in, in UK and in the UK and so on. So we will, uh, we will play with, with Qiskit. So either you install it in your in your local environment, so, so pip install Qiskit, it's pretty easy. Pip install Qiskit, or if you don't want to install anything today, you can you can play with it uh, from the not, from the Jupyter notebook environment that is incorporated inside uh, inside the IBM Quantum Experience platform. So I will play in my local environment, but if you want to do the same, you just have to open a new notebook here. Wait a, wait a little bit. Bruno, were you looking for me? Yeah, but it's all right. I okay, sorry about that. I, I got if there are other questions, but uh, I opened the chat. Oh, good, good. Thanks. I had a Amazon, a lost Amazon delivery guy calling me for some reason. All right, I'm back here. Full yeah. attention. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. So when opening Qiskit from, uh, from IBM Quantum Experience, as you can see, some import uh, have, uh, have been already, already done for you. Uh, but I will remove everything because we will start for, from scratch today. So just open the notebook. I will do the same as, uh, on my side. So I open the notebook. And what I propose, uh, what I propose for, for today as an exercise for, for you guys for, for coding as a, as a first quantum program, is that we'll, we'll try to code, we'll try to, to execute on both a classical simulator and a quantum processor. We'll try to execute the Grover's algorithm that I presented on Monday. So for, for those of you who are not here on Monday, uh, I will briefly, I will, I will briefly explain it again. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Okay, so what we will do today is that we will start with an unsorted database of four elements that uh, I will label zero, two, three, and one. So it's unsorted, that's why uh, the one is on the right, for instance. And let's say that we are looking for the elements number three. So we want to find, uh, we want to, we want to find by, uh, by requesting a database, we want, we want to, to find the elements Called, uh, the element number three. So in, in, in classical uh, in the in classical in classical physics, I will say in classical computing, uh, when looking for an element in uh, in an unsorted database of four elements, if you're really unlucky, you will find the good element after four requests. In average, after two, if you uh, if you're really lucky, you will find the good one after only one request. 
But in the quantum world, I will try to convince you one more time that we can access it uh, after only one request to what I call the database or what I call the Oracle. Sorry. Okay. okay, so we're looking for element number three. In the quantum domain, only one try. In the classical domain, four tries if you're unlucky, two in average. So the first thing to do is to map the digital value into a binary value, into binary values, so I mean into bits. So zero goes to zero, zero, one to zero, one, and, and so on. And I remind you that we are looking for elements numbers, we are looking for the element number three. So the one, one. Because we need two bits, we are playing here with only two quantum registers and no more, but we can generalize to any configuration, but for today it will be enough. So I remind you that the first step of the algorithm is to put everything in superposition. So we are we are building with Adam Gates here a superposition of 0, 0, plus 1, 1, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0. So everything is at the same level in the superposition as everything is counted positive. So when looking forward to the, uh, the probability amplitude, everything is at the same level, so that is 25% each. So at this point, if we make a measurement just right now, it will be only noise. In a, in a quarter of, in a, sometimes it will be zero, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes one with the equal chain, with unequal chains. So it's only what, I, what we can call noise, nothing more. Then the second step is what we call the oracle. So the oracle will, uh, will tag the state that you are looking at. So in our case, it's state three, so state one, one in terms of binary representation. So what happened with the oracle is that in the superposition, it will, it will, switch, the, it will switch the sign of the, of the solution of your problem into the superposition. So you had a zero plus one plus two plus three before, and now you have zero plus two minus three plus one. So zero zero plus zero one my, uh, plus one plus one zero minus one one. So we have, we we have changed the sign into the superposition for the term that is solution of our problem. And then comes the step the step three. So step three is what we call the reflection. The reflection. We can say we can we can explain it this way. The reflection step will compute the average value of the four coefficients into your superposition. So it's a dashed line here. And then it will reflect everything regarding the average value. So the terms that you are looking at, the terms term number three, that is solution of the problem, will be reinforced it will go to something like almost 100% into the superposition and it's positive. And all the other solutions, the ones that we don't want, the, the, the terms that are not really solutions of our problem, will, uh, will be almost at, uh, at zero, at a, at a zero level. So when measuring at the end, when going to step four, we, that is a measurement, in almost 100% cases, you will get state number three. You will measure one, one. And so you are happy with that. So when I say that the quantum, uh, the quantum version of the problem, uh, you, you, you have to, to request the database only one, what I mean with it, with that, is that you, you, you need to execute step two and step three only once. Uh, so for instance, if the database size is not four, but some maybe 100, if you have an 100, uh, 100 elements into the database and that you are looking for only one of them, in the classical domain, in the classical uh, in classical computing, you will have to request the database 50 times in average, 100 if you are unlucky. But in the classical case, it's roughly speaking, it's something like square root of, of 100. So it's not really 10, but it's, uh, actually it's eight. You will need to, to execute your secrets at eight times, not the whole circuit, but you will have to repeat eight times, step number two and step number three. So you will step by step converge to the solution. That is when doing the reflex, uh, when doing the oracle step and the reflection step, you will not directly end up with the right solution in 100% cases. You will reinforce it 
and you will lower the other ones, but you will not end up directly after one iteration with 100% uh, coefficient on two numbers on, on the solution three and zero on the other ones. So you have to repeat many times. So step by step, the solution number three will be reinforced and the other one uh, will be turned to zero. Uh, and if you go more than eight, if you go to nine, 10 or 10 or 11, I don't know, then it's uh, it's like a cycle. The solution number three will be will return to to twenty five, and the other one will will come back to to twenty five, and, and so on. It's like it's like a cycle. So you have to you have to do it exactly the, the right amount of time. All, all right for everybody. Is it okay for the Groover's algorithm? So I I think one of the questions. I certainly have is the uh, that comment you have to do it the right number of times yes uh, and you know obviously we can't I guess it's obvious we can't measure it to see where we are uh, and say oh I, I need to do it three more times etc uh, um, actually it's not uh, how to say uh, it's not like uh, let's try and let's see what happens. There's yeah. an exact there's a mathematical relation that tells you uh, how many how many steps do you need, how many Groover step do you need. Uh, regarding it's not square root of n directly, but it's proportional. Uh, it's something like uh, I don't want to say I can show you, but uh, okay, maybe I have it somewhere here. So there is a form. So there is a formula based on n as the number of times yeah, as you, can you see need here, to flip the signs. As you can see here, it's a cycle process. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, with uh, with sixteen, uh, with a uh, size of sixteen, uh, data bases of sixteen, uh, of sixteen, yeah. you will need something like maybe uh, maybe something like uh, one to three steps, or maybe 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 I don't know maybe seven, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, or nine steps. Nine steps is nice. Even uh, fifteen steps is, is nice uh, as well. So, so, but if you go back there, so um, yeah, I'm just looking for the formula. If I have it on the oh, side, okay. but I don't have it. Uh, but it's it's not square root of n, but uh, something like this. There, there's yeah. a p. There's, there's a pi in the story. A so, pi over four somewhere. But if you if you look at you know that the um, sine curve there, essentially it looks right. Yes. right? So which which indicates it's it's cyclic, cyclical as you mentioned. Yes. So let's say the magic formula says you need to do this process five times given the number whatever n is. I assume yes. it's just based on that. So so let's say the magic number is five, uh, you know, and you go to six. You're actually getting a worse response if you go to six. But yes. if you went to ten for whatever reason. You would be back at that that sweet spot again, yeah. right? As you, can, as you can see, we are in improving the results after yeah. one, two, and three iteration. But after three, uh, the result is going uh, is going down. So there's mm. the, so the probability of having the good answer is going down uh, up to five, and then it starts to increase again. So this is what happened when marking only one value, as we did, uh, as yes, as we did. Yeah. We marked only value number three which is the solution of our problem. But what happens if you mark more than one value? This is something that I didn't say before, but uh, well, you, can, uh, you can have give many solutions, not only one. Maybe, uh, maybe one is also OK, not only three, but maybe also one is, is, is an acceptable solution. So, if, for so, instance, so but, but if there was, if you go back where you were just a second ago, you yes. know, just to keep it simple and clear, I th correct me if I'm wrong. So looking at this, landscape, if you will, mm -hmm. if I had whatever number n this is, uh, uh, as it kind of indicates in your text, so the, the best, the, the optimal number of times to f flip and mirror is 15, because that it looks mm -hmm. like it's 99.9%, mm -hmm. wh whereas uh, nine, eight or nine times comes 
98%, let's say. Yeah, but but and, I, I, did, I didn't say much uh, on noise, but uh, I didn't really explain uh, where the noise is coming from and so on, but uh, there's a noise story as well. So because of noise, maybe it's better to run 15, uh, maybe it's better to run 15, uh, 15 times uh, the flip and the mirror, the mirror steps. But if you run 15 times, uh, the amount of noise that you, that you, that you, that uh, destroys that uh, shit. Uh, the amount of uh, the amount of noise will uh, will destroy the, the results will uh, will lower the, the success pro the success uh, probability. So this is the theoret the theoretical curve. But in practice, there's a noise. Yeah. So maybe so, it's better to, to run nine times than fifteen times. Even if in theory, fifteen times should be better than nine. Yeah. Okay. So this is assuming a perfect qubit, noiseless yes. qubit, yes. and uh, you know since noise can be more costly than us beginners think, because I've seen uh, data on how noisy these things are. So there's a tremendous, would you agree? There's a tremendous value in doing it eight times and having a 98% hit rate versus, as you said, the 15 times and going for the 99.9. .9. Yeah, so for instance, this so, semester, uh, three of my students were working for a project onto the, on the Groover's algorithm. Uh, and so they, they, they played with uh, two, two qubit circuits at the beginning. It was working pretty well. Then they, 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 they worked. I can show you the results if you want. Uh, if I remember, give me one second. Open the report. So as you can see here, the the the, the first played with a a, a two side a, a circuit of two qubits, so a database of four instances. And so as you can see on the right side, it's a simulator result, so it's perfect, of course. And on the right side, it's the result when executing the algorithm on an actual QPU. So you can distinguish well, quite well, the solutions from uh, from the others, with uh, almost eighty percent of success. But then, when going to to three qubits, for instance, uh, you have to run the algorithm more than one time to to, to go to, to 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 the solutions, as I presented before. And so, as you can see, the the noise is much more higher. The other solutions, I mean. They are much more, they contribute much more than, than before, even if you apply the, the right number of steps. And after, when you go to a quantum circuit of four, without any optimization of the circuit uh, and noise, then you cannot distinguish the solution anymore. And, and that each one of those that you just, that are showing here, that's yes. after one, one iteration. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, and so, so, so doing two iterations mm -hmm. won't necessarily clean up that mess. Yeah, so that's why the Groover's algorithm, as well as the Shor's algorithm, for instance, uh, that's why we won't be able to, to run those algorithms in the near future. Mm -hmm. you, we will be able to, to run those algorithms in maybe 10 years or, or, or more, I don't know, when we will be able to, to implement what we call, uh, uh, what we call uh, error correcting codes on top of the quantum algorithm. So we can actually correct the, the noise, we can correct the effect of noise while running the quantum algorithms. But for doing so, I will explain it on Friday, you need something like 1000 auxiliary qubits for having only one logical qubit. I mean, one a logical qubit is the one that you need for the algorithm. So you need, uh, you need, uh, you need 1000 or maybe even 10,000 qubits for only one uh, logical qubit into, into your circuit. So it's yeah. a lot. So at the moment, we only can work with something like 10 to 50 to maybe 100 qubits. So we are not able to implement uh, error correcting codes. So that's why the Groover search or the Scholes algorithm are what we call long term algorithm. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Any, any questions from anybody out there? I mean, this is. In my opinion, this is a very important thing to understand. It's not necessarily difficult, yeah, okay. uh, we'll but come back on it on, on Friday anyway. Oh, okay. Because you know, when you we have presentations by, you know, 
normal presentations. They're not going to take the time to explain this, but we got Bruno's attention here. So, um, you know, take advantage of that. This is this is important stuff to understand, I think, uh, that you don't get in the books, et cetera. But there's a question from uh, Garish. You got, got time, Bruno? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, as there are many tools slash vendors, Qiskit, QSharp, et cetera, ah, uh, this is my question. How do you, uh, as well, how do you decide where to put, so given all these different tools, uh, how does one go about deciding where, uh, to, where to put your effort in learning? Um, uh, you know, w given your experience, and also I would ask, I would add, if you were to need to solve a, a problem using a quantum computer, which, which hardware would you be going to immediately? And I think that would help answer the question. Would you be going to Qiskit or, or yeah, okay. you know, so Rigetti, et cetera? The, okay, so there are two questions in one. So there is hmm. one question regarding the software choice and the second one regarding the hardware choice. So I will maybe uh, start uh, answering uh, with the hardware. I don't think it was a question, but I will answer. Uh, regarding the hardware, it actually depends on the, on the applications. Uh, there is no there is no magic response uh, until you you try it yourself. That's why it's really interesting having having some platforms like for instance the QCWare platform that I presented before the QCWare mm. Forge, mm. because you can you can run the same algorithm. Uh, you, you you can code it on top of different hardware platforms and then you can execute on on different hardware. So you can actually compare what's going on when execute your your circuit onto superconducting qubits or onto ions qubits or maybe even uh, spin qubits in silicons or topological qubits or, or whatever, I don't know. So, um, so you have to try to, to know what, well, what, what the best, what, what the best for you. Uh, some, I, I, will, I will detail it on, on Friday, but uh, all, not a single platform have all the advantage at the same time. Uh, some of them have some advantages regarding the number of operations that you can implement per second. Uh, but the quality of the the quality of the results are quite bad. I mean, uh, there is a lot of noise uh, because they are not really well isolated. Some other platforms are better in uh, in terms of isolation, so less errors, but uh, less operation per second. So it's it really it really it really depends on, on your application, I would say. So I don't have a single answer for for, for this question. Yeah, I'm. I you know I think for conversation's sakes, there's there's really two. There's a first choice you you might want to make, and I, I'm not saying which one's better or worse, but you know, one is uh, just go for a hardware uh, specific like his kit, right? And they, you know, and just go for that and understand, you know, try to get some understanding around algorithm development, et cetera. Then then take a, a quick look at the others. In other words, build a foundation, um, and then the other. Uh, is I'm starting to investigate this is like Forge, the QCWare Forge. Uh, I'm starting to dig into the Rigetti. Uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, Zapata um, Orchestra, which mm -hmm. also is kind of hardware independent. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and if you're if you're a company, if you're uh, if you're a company and uh, and you want to to go into the world of quantum computing. Uh, of course, you won't do it alone. So you need to partner with some uh, uh, some expert company like I don't know maybe Zapata, One Qubit, or, or whatever, or IBM. Uh, but you have to take care that the algorithms that you will develop for your domain-specific applications they, they they have to be hardware agnostic. So you really have to take care of that because if your if your software is not hardware agnostic and you can run it on a sing on on a single platform but not on all of them. It might be the case that in a few years you will realize that the platforms that your algorithms can run on is not the is not the winner. I mean, it's not the yeah. best one. Maybe superconducting qubits will fail, or trapped ions will fail. I don't know. Maybe one of them will not succeed, or all of them. So, well, so I think we're, uh, I, I think for our audience today, you know, we're thinking, if I may, folks, uh, we're thinking more hello world level. Stuff, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, but, 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 but pay attention that the, the software is hardware agnostic when working with partners uh, on developing quantum computing yeah. tools for your business. I so mean, that's, that's my message. 
one, one thing, uh, you know, that we might consider in this question is, you know, just look at the support and the documentation. Actually, support, I don't think would be the right word for it, um, but yeah. documentation. So, I mean, would you agree that IBM, Qiskit, and uh, Microsoft Q Sharp by far uh, compared to all the other options out there, if you wanted to learn uh, quantum that, you know, they've got a lot of, a ton of stuff out there for beginners, for yeah, newbies okay. like us. Yeah, then it's, it's up to you. I mean, uh, regarding the, the language, um, for instance, I'm really, I feel really comfortable with Qiskit because uh, I think Qiskit is for people who are not coming from the world of the, of, uh, of development from, uh, from yeah. computer science. I'm a physicist, so for me, Qiskit is really it's, it's really easy. But for my students in computer science school, sometimes they tell me, "Well, we don't really like Qiskit. It's like uh, it's not it's not the way we are used to code. I mean, it's not." Uh, it's, it's what I said. I think it's for people that are not used to, to code a lot, that are not coming from computer science, but more for physics or, or another domain. Um, maybe Cirque is more, um, is more, uh, is more, will be more familiar for, Cirque is the one from Google, it's the Python library uh -huh. from Google. Uh -huh. Maybe Cirque is better for you if you're coming from computer science. Uh, Qiskit and uh, Cirque are, are um, really low level, I mean, in terms of, uh, of syntax. Uh, so maybe you will prefer Q-sharp because Q-sharp is more higher level, you will call a function more, um, more easily. Um, so maybe Q-sharp is better if you don't want to, to have the, the end in the dirty too, too much. So it's up to you. So try them all, <laughs> try yours, and then pick one and work with this one. Come on, man. We're, we're, you're in a superposition state, dude. We want to yeah. get you to it. We want to measure you. you. Yeah. You got to commit. I, but, but to I, I would I would say my opinion would be, and this is you know how I'm handling it when I'm trying to teach people. I I would go with Kiskit to start yeah. to start, yeah. and I wouldn't stay there long. But mm -hmm. I would I, I I think the documentation, uh, IBM's pumping out lots of videos right now, etc. Um, you know, there's a growing community to its credit. They've got the you know the uh, IBM challenge that came out, which is a good exercise, which I'll mention at the end of today, something about that. But uh, you know, to, to you know, we're looking for an answer here. I, I, I think Kiss Kit would be the way to go um, as a first, very first step. Yeah. And, and and you know, that would be my two cents, even though yeah. I'm not being asked. But we got a yeah. whole bunch of other questions here. Yeah, man. but I, I will answer to the second one. Does Raker structure depend on the item number? Of course, it depends. That's the idea. I mean, the Oracle is specifically designed uh, to tag the state that you are looking at. The Oracle will flip the sign in front of the, of the term that is solution of your problem. That is the term that you are looking at uh, at the end when, uh, when requesting the, the, data, the database. So in our case, the Oracle uh, is useful for tagging state number three, or what I call in binary state one one. So of course, the Oracle is uh, is specific uh, to your solution. And then we have a question on machine learning. Um, could you please elaborate and say more about which frequently used machine learning algorithm problem could be done much faster or better on a quantum computer? Let's assume we have such a computer today. Uh, okay. So I can say words on machine learning, no problem. Machine learning can be, I say can, I don't know, can be a really interesting use case for quantum computers. Uh, why that? Uh, because machine learning is full of uh, basic linear algebra like matrix inversion, eigenvalues uh, computation, and so on. So, for instance, I can give a few few examples. Uh, you can you can get an exponential speed up on a principal component analysis uh, computation in statistics in statistics to. Uh, to, to reduce uh, the dimension uh, the dimension of a data set. Uh, to, to make it more simple, so you can uh, you have an, an exponential speed up on it um, because you have to compute eigenvalues, and so quantum computing uh, can help uh, to compute eigenvalues much more faster with an exponential speed up. You can uh, you can also do uh, what we call support vector machine, which is uh, a quantum algorithm in classical machine learning. So we, you can improve performance with an exponential speed up. Um, I think for this one. Um, with the hybrid approach that I will more detail on Friday, uh, you can also try to reproduce uh, what we 
what we usually call a neural network because a parameterized quantum circuit can be seen as a neural network. So with a cost function, uh, you can iterate and optimize the, paramet the, the parameters of a quantum circuit to, to reproduce quantum mechanically speaking a neural network and you can do some classification task or clustering task or, or whatever you want with a neural network. Uh, you can also improve, um, you can, you, you, there are many, 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 many things that you can improve in machine learning. Uh, but then uh, there's a point that is complicated it's the question of how do you charge the data into the algorithm? That is the problem of the quantum random access memory, if I can, if I can say like this. It's really not easy to, to map a classical data set onto a quantum circuit. Because um, why that? If you have a single feature in machine learning, like for instance, I don't know the, the size of people, if, if it is uh, your single feature, then it's easy to map it onto the coefficients of a quantum state. So you, you map it this way on a quantum on a quantum state. So it's pretty easy. Then you normal you of course you normalize it, you normalize the data, and then you map it on a quantum vector, on a quantum state. But it's much more complicated when you have many features to map all of them onto a quantum circuit. So instead of mapping it on quantum states, you will map it on quantum operators. And it's with your operators that you will try to reproduce the same matrix as the one that is your data set. And there are some tricks because usually a data set is not Hermitian and a quantum, quantum operators have to be unitary, sometimes Hermitian. So, so there are some tricks to, to map the data set onto a quantum circuit with some operators and then you can run it. But, but the time to charge, the time, the, the time to, the time to, 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 to go from the QRAM to the to, to the QPU, uh, one time, two times, three times, and so on, you have to loop. The, the time for that can be really costly. And because of that, it might be the case that you will lose the advantage you have uh, with the algorithm itself. So quantum machine learning should be much faster unless we have quantum random access memories that we can access fast enough. So that, that's the answer. All right, guys. So we can return onto the onto the coding exercise if we if you're not too if it's not too late for you. For me, it's okay. So we will try to we will try to to code to implement the Groover's algorithm from scratch. So you will learn how to use Qiskit uh, in Jupyter Notebook environment, for instance. So first thing first. You have to to pip install Qiskit if you didn't uh, if you haven't did it before you can play into the into the cloud onto the IBM Quantum Experience. So the first thing the first thing to do is to to import it from Qiskit. Import everything. Then I will import some specific uh, specific things inside Qiskit that I will need later. I will explain later when I will use them. So for instance, from Qiskit. Dot tools for a visualization. I will import plot, sorry, plot histogram. I will also import from qiskit.tools for monitor. This will be useful to see uh, where you are in the queue when executing the, the algorithm. And finally, the last, the last import is from qiskit.providers. .ibmq. Import list buzzy. So as you can understand, it will be useful to, to find the list buzzy processors in the list. So the first thing to do is to design the circuit, of course. Let's start with that. So the first thing to do is to create a circuit. Acting on the quantum registers. That we call the Q registers. So let's go for that. So I will call, I will create a, a circuit object. So I call it circuit. 
And so in Qiskit, to build a, a new quantum circuit, you have the quantum circuit object. So it's just an empty circuit like this, where I specify that I want two quantum registers and two classical registers. So on the left side, the quantum, the quantum registers, on the right, the circuit registers. So now I have an empty circuit with nothing on it. It's just an empty shell. So step one, remember, it's about superposition. So I take my circuit and I put everything in superposition with Adamar gate. So that is. Step two is about the oracle. So for the oracle, there's a gate called the control Z gate that we flip the sign in our case of the one one of the one one term, which is solution. Remember, we are looking for an, for state number three, which is the one one state. So the control Z, you have to specify first which of the qubits is the control and which of the qubits uh, is the target. But in this case, the gate is reversible, so it doesn't matter. But for a control not gate, it can be important to, to specify well the order. So we are done with the oracle. So step three is about the reflection, remember? So the reflection, you first need all the more gates as be as for its proposition. We then need X gates so or not gates if you prefer. Then we need one more time a, a control Z gate. And then one more time X gate and H and H gate. So it's done. And so step four, step four is about the measurement. So we have to map the quantum registers to the classical register. So for that, there is a simple method in Qiskit called, called measurement. Amazing. Uh, measure, sorry, not measurement. And so you have to map quantum register zero and one on two classical registers, zero and one. And so finally, we can draw the circuit. Uh, there are many possibilities to draw it. So for instance, I like to, to draw it in, lat in LaTeX. But you can also plot it with uh, Matplotlib, for instance. So here it is. Here is a Groover's search algorithm um, quantum circuit for a database of four inputs. So what's going on next? What's going on next is to execute it on a classical processor. Let's start with, with that. So we have to specify uh, the back end, of course. So we will use the, the Kazam simulator that I presented before. Sorry, I create a new object that I call back end. So back end will simply be error.get back end. And so I specified the Kazam simulator. All right. Then next step is about executing the circuit. So for that, I create what I call a job, which is a new object. 
So what I execute, I execute the circuit on which backend, on the one that I just specified, and I have also to specify the number of shots, so the number of times that I will, that I will do my experiment. So let's say 4086, it has to be a multiple of the memory. I, I mean, it's better to do it this way. And so finally, we will grab the results. With this method. And we will analyze them. So we can print it. So we can print the number of one ones that we got after running the circuit 4,000 times. So quants is actually a dictionary in Python. So the key are the, are the expected value. So one one zero zero one zero zero one. So the, the key is the, is the value is the output and the, and the value itself is the, is the number of times that you got this value. So we are looking for the one one results. So I specify, I specify it. And so finally we can plot everything. So plot histogram. Okay. So as you can see when running on the classical simulator, in for, uh, with 100 percent, uh, in 100 percent uh, cases, we got the good, the, the, the right results as expected, because with a database of uh, four tries and, uh, and only one uh, one iteration, one cycle, one request to the oracle, uh, we necessarily got 100 percent of success. So this is what we what we obtain when running on the classical simulator. Okay, so so far so good. Then we will do the same thing, but with an actual quantum processor. So the first thing to do is to connect to your uh, IBM account. So for that, you have to, to you have to specify the the API uh, the API token. So let's go into the IBM Quantum Experience platforms. Platform. Go into your say, uh, setting uh, account settings here, my account, and you will be given an API token uh, on the right side. So copy paste it into the into the notebook so this is mine so this is to to save your account onto your onto your laptop in local and after that you have to, to load the account because it's not uh, save accounts and that doesn't load the account itself you have to do it yourself with the method load account So it's telling me that the credentials are already present because I already connected before. But for you, I think it's uh, it's not the same. Okay, so then let's see what are the backends that are available at the moment on IBM. So you have the method get providers, get providers, sorry. And here you have to specify a hub. So specifying a hub is like specifying on which hardware, on which partner, let's say, on which uh, hardware partner uh, you want to, to run it, you want to run your, your algorithm on. So for instance, I will specify that I want to work 
with the processors from IBM. But I can also specify that I want to work, for instance, with the processors from AQT. AQT is a, is a Australian, not Australian, but Australian company uh, providing uh, trapped ions quantum processors. So now with Qiskit, I can access both the superconducting qubit processors from IBM, which is what I'm doing now, or I can also access, uh, upon request, I think, um, the trapped ion systems from uh, from uh, Alpine Quantum Technologies. Okay. So I specified the hub, it's done. And now let's see what I can actually access in terms of QPUs. So here is the list of available backends. So it's the same that on the, on the Quantum Experience platform. So I have the Kazam simulator, so the classical machine. I have uh, the Melbourne processors, the Vigo, the London, the Burlington, the SX, uh, and so on processors. So it doesn't give me uh, much information, only the name, and if it's open or not. But if I want to, 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 to get more information, like the number of job, uh, the number of jobs pending, which can be useful if you want to select a processor, if you don't want to, to wait for, for too long, then we can access more details the following way. There's a method status that will give you more information. So as you can see here, you have the number of job pendings. So on the classical simulator, there's nothing pending at the moment, but on the one in, uh, which one is it? Uh, back in stage, on the IBM QX2, there are four job pendings and so on. So from, from the status, you can, uh, you can then specify uh, the ones that you prefer. So let's select a backend. So for that, there's a useful, uh, there's a useful function in Qiskit that allow you to, to specify without having to do anything, uh, the one that is the less busy. I will specify, I will specify this one by using this method. The method is called less busy, this busy, is the one that I uh, import at the beginning. Now you understand why. So provider.backends. And here I just specify that I don't allow the function to, to take the Kazam simulator because I actually want to, I want to actually run it on a, on a quantum processor and not on a classical simulator. So we can check the one that has been selected. Give me one second. Okay, I don't want to spend uh, 
to spend my day finding what's going wrong. Uh, I run it before, I run it earlier just to anticipate this kind of situation. Uh, so when specifying, for instance, here, uh, the least busy, the least busy QPU, uh, in the, in, when I executed earlier in uh, today, it was, uh, it was giving me the IBM Q London uh, QPU. So we'll run on this one. And so uh, then the next step is exactly the same as before. You specify, you execute it. So you specify your job. So you, you execute the circuit on the QPU that you, you just specified for the same number of shots. Then comes the job monitor that we didn't have before. It's just a, a function in Qiskit that allow you to, to see uh, how many jobs are pending and your position into the queue. So you can have a, a Ruth ID or how many times or how long times you have to, to wait for your results to, to arrive. And so then it's the same story as before. You obtain the results, you get the counts and you plot them. So as you can see here, when running on an actual quantum processor, the success probability is not 100% as expected by the theory, but more something like, in our case, like something like 85% of success. So the 0, 0, the 0, 1, and the 1, 0 contributions are here because of the noise, the different noises that you can have into uh, inside a quantum process unit. Like for instance, uh, the jitters, uh, the jitters into the electronic uh, into the electronic pulses that drives uh, the gates. So this is what we call the coherent noise. So I mean, still a unitary operation that is implemented, but not exactly the one that is uh, expected by by the theory. So this is what we call the coherent not the coherent noise. It's more about the jitters, and we also have uh, the contribution of the environment. Your, your processors, your qubits will entangle with the environment. And because of that, uh, you can have sometimes a bit flip that is unwanted. You can have a phase flip that is a sign into the superposition that can switch without having specifying anything to, to do it. So this is, uh, this is what we call, uh, for instance, uh, incoherent noise. Uh, it's the interaction of the system with the environment. So because of all those noise, and some others that I didn't mention, uh, at the end, uh, you obtain something like only 85% of success probability. Yeah, so I think we are done with this uh, tutorial, unless you have some question, maybe is it the case? Uh, any, question, question, yeah. any questions out there, folks? Yeah, uh, sometimes yeah, you're saying that it is not able to run it with, uh, to draw the circuit with the, la with the LaTeX uh, editor. Yeah. LaTeX, is, yeah. Okay, I expected it because uh, to run on the LaTeX editor, you need an additional package to download. Uh, it's just a, it's just a file to put in your current environment. So for you to to to, to plot your circuit with LaTeX, uh, with LaTeX, it's not uh, it's not native. But uh, you can also you can also plot it with uh, Matplotlib. With the, we write it in the chat. You have to specify MPL. Uh, as an output, so you can. Uh, this is with Matplotlib. And so, what else? Uh, assuming a quantum computer was available today, would several people be able to use such a quantum computer in a time-sharing mode, like classical computer? Uh, in other words, would we have several people solving their task problems concurrently and have the computer swap the context and the data and register? <laughs> Uh, well, at the moment, when uh, I'm not sure that I have an answer to, to this question. Can I try uh, it? Yeah, you can yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay, think about it, folks. Uh, uh, the notion of computer swapping the content and the data in registers between tasks, think about that for a second, right? The, we can't copy data, right? We got the no cloning rule for one, so that makes any any effort in that regard very difficult you could entangle qubits yeah i will be back in one minute okay yeah i'll take some air time here so uh essentially uh we can't we got a no cloning rule which means you can't copy data all right so what but you can entangle qubits 
as we are learning in quantum networks. Uh, so, you know, if you were to swap jobs in and out, as we do in the classical world, uh, pro you know, you could probably do it, but the overhead in doing that would just, you know, make it pointless. So, uh, you know, that's a good question for the guys at the hardware level, exactly how do they manage that? But my suspicion is it's just like the old days, 1960s in computers before we had time sharing, you know, a job goes in, we call them jobs, a, a, a task goes in uh, and it completes and then uh, it gets, you know, the system gets reset and then the next task goes in. So uh, if anybody has a different view on that, by all means chime in here. Um, anybody out in the audience there? Um, yeah, so, yeah, because of the no cloning rule, it would just, it wouldn't make any sense that the swapping uh, of the states, if you will, in and out, like we do all the time, even on your laptop, which happens, I don't know, how many times a second, um, that, that's just not, not a practical thing to do on a quantum computer. Anybody, uh, uh, Bruno, good job. Uh, output equals, oh, that's you. Most complete presentation ever. You know, man. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so that would imply one person would hog the expensive resources, so to speak. Well, good question. So uh, yes, one person could uh, hog the expensive resources, but, and again, I'm not, I, I don't have my hands in the, in the dough, so we'd have to really ask an engineer. But remember, the resources only last less than a second. So uh, there's really not much uh, um, hogging that you could do, really. Uh, but that is a, so I, I, if you think that through, I think that kind of thing, uh, just by its nature, can't happen right now. But uh, um, in the future, I'm sure that'll be a problem. So here's another one. Can you see someone, that? One, uh, yeah, I, I will answer the, the last one. Okay. So someone is asking about the Google's algorithm. Uh, what's going on if it's not only two registers, but much more, a, a much bigger database? So how can we, how can we, for instance, tag the number twenty, or maybe, or I don't know, maybe another number, a bigger one, which is not uh, just uh, one one. Uh, so for that, uh, the record is pretty simple to 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 write. I mean, um, maybe we, we can go here. I wanted to present this thing after, but I will do it now. Um, okay. Regarding the Oracle step, if you want to, to tag the value one one, so the value three, as I said before, the only thing you need is a control Z. Why a control Z? Because the control Z, if the control qubit is one, then it will change the sign of the second qubit if the second qubit is also in state one. So if you have zero, 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 nothing will happen. Same with zero, one, same with one, zero. But if you enter with one, one, then you will end up with minus one, one. All right. So that's the way we tag the value three, the value one, one. Now, if you want to tag something else, like for instance, you want to tag the value zero, so zero, zero in, bi in binary. So if you want to do it, you, you first need to transform the zero, zero into one, one to apply the Z gate. So you transform for, for a while, the zero zero into a one one by applying a NOT gate on both registers, so the X here. Then you apply the Z gate, so the one one goes to minus one one. And at the same time, the original one one in the superposition went to zero zero, so nothing happened to this term. So you switch the new one one to minus one one. And after that, the minus one one is switch again, so to become minus zero zero. So one more time, you have taken the, you, you have successfully taken the, the value that you are looking that you, that you want. And then it's the same for zero one or one zero, depending on, on your case. You just have to put an X, an X gate on both sides of the control Z gate on the, on the good registers. And that's, uh, that's the way it generalizes. Now, one more comment. One more comment. As I said earlier, 
I don't know if you if you got this this piece of information, but when co at the compiling step, when coming from the from the Python code or from the from the circuit in the in the graphical user interface from the composer, at some point everything is compiled into single qubit gates and two qubit gates. In Qiskit, in IBM uh, with IBM stuff, it's not possible to implement physically speaking. I mean, at the level of pulses. It's not possible to implement more than uh, two side uh, qubit gates. So you cannot implement three qubit gates or four qubit gates uh, with a single electronic uh, with a single electronic pulse. So because of that, you need to decompose everything. Like for instance, let's say we don't have two registers here, but three. So instead of a control Z, what you will need here is a control control Z. So it's more or less the same. You need the two control qubits to be one for the target qubit to be flipped if, it's a, if the target qubit is, is in state one. So it's just a generalization. But because of the physical uh, limitations of the device in the way that it has been uh, engineered, then you cannot directly implement, physically speaking, a double control Z. So you have to split it into uh, more, element, uh, more elementary gates like uh, different control Z, uh, simple control Z and, and other gates. So it can be really costly when the size of the circuits becomes to, 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 to be, um, becomes to be huge. It can be very really costly in terms of a number of gates to decompose the Oracle into more, more elementary gates. So it can be a limitations. It will add noise into the process, of course. And so the results won't be, uh, won't be that good. Uh, I think I answered the question. If it's not the case, uh, just let me know. Okay, so someone else is asking. Based on what we know today, could we compress and uncompress the data on a quantum computer? Uh, okay, I don't have time to to explain um, to explain it in depth. But you can maybe have a look on the internet to a protocol called the super dense coding, with classical information. There's only one bit of information uh, per bit, of course. You cannot, uh, you cannot encode more than one bit on one bit of classical information. That is obvious. But in quantum computing, there is a protocol called the super dense, uh, super dense coding. Uh, so you need, uh, you inside this protocol, you play with uh, entanglement, with quantum entanglement, and and with because of quantum entanglement, because of some correlations that you have in quantum mechanics, you can see that you can encode more than one bit of classical information into a single quantum bit. Quantum bit. So maybe you can have a look uh, to it. Uh, we always talk about Shores, Groovers, Dutch, etc. Is there a library of quantum algorithms somewhere? And how and how many are there? Perfect. So I can conclude my talk with that. Thanks for the question. Uh, before to, 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 to end up the, the talk, I wanted to show you two, two resources. So the first resources can be, can, be access, uh, can be accessed on archive. Archive, for those of you who don't know what is it, is, uh, is an open library where researchers have published uh, their publication before the, uh, before the publication to be accepted in a peer-reviewed peer journal. So you can find uh, you can find uh, almost everything in open access before it's uh, it's published in a in a in a paper in a in a in a journal. So here there is this really nice uh, review article from um, from March two thousand twenty. So it's uh, it's quite uh, it's, uh, it's state of the art. I mean, inside this one you have a large library of algorithms that are presented in. I would say in simple words. I mean, it's really, it's really well written. I, I usually give this document to read to my to my students. So you have something like twenty algorithms that are detailed inside uh, this paper. So, like for instance, uh, the bernstein brzezirani algorithm. Okay, this one is not really useful. Uh, the Groover's algorithm that we mentioned today. Uh, you have some algorithms to solve the linear systems of equations. Uh, the Shor's algorithm for factorization as well. Uh, so those algorithms are the ones that we won't be able to implement uh, in the near future. But you have also some uh, some uh, hybrid quantum classical algorithms for next years, for the, the year for the 
for a closed future. Like the QAOA, QAOA is an algorithm to, to find the, the best routes on a graph. So it can be really useful for traffic optimization, for, uh, for uh, energy optimization on the, uh, on the smart grid, or, or, or anything like this that you can map on a graph. Uh, there's also, where is it? Uh, I can find it. I don't see it, but it's somewhere the variational quantum eigen solver. So to compute the, the lower eigenvalue of, uh, of an operator, that can be very useful to, to compute the, the come on, how do you call it? Um, the, the, funda the fundamental energy level of a molecule. So there are uh, big applications, uh, big, uh, big possibilities with that in uh, chemistry and pharmacology to, for new drugs, for new, cat for new catalysts and, and everything. So have a look to this paper. I will send it to you in the chat. Yeah, they really already did it. Perfect. I'm one step ahead of you, man. You are a perfect assistant. And, and Helen's the, second... the perfect assistant. <laughs> I have to introduce and, uh, you to Helen sometime. Yeah, and a second resource I wanted to share that I really that I really appreciate. Is this, uh, is this online, I would say this online book, it's not really a book, it's more a collection of tutorials uh, to learn uh, quantum computing with Qiskit. So you will find in the first chapter some information on basics of quantum mechanics and basic of quantum circuits, quantum gates and so on. Uh, yeah, so the basics. And after that, there are many tutorials on uh, quantum algorithms so both algorithms for long-term applications, so non-parametric quantum circuits, the ones that are fully quantum, like the Shores or the Groovers. Uh, you will find some algorithms for communication application, like the teleportation or super dense coding, so not really computing, but it's more quantum communication, uh, but still you will implement it on quantum processors. But in practice, uh, it's more something to, to implement with photons and optical fibers. It's not really for electronic processors. Uh, some not very useful algorithm like Dodgeosa and Persson Vazirani is to check the parity of a function, for instance, or so not very useful like this, but they can be useful uh, as subroutines for other algorithms like the Shor's algorithm, the quantum Fourier transform, the quantum Fourier estimation, and so on and so on. And after that, you have some hybrid quantum classical approach like the QAOAs that I just mentioned like uh, quantum neural networks, like a rational quantum eigen solver for simulating molecules. So you have many, 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 many examples inside this, uh, inside on this website. And, um, and they are still improving it. So every month so you have new material published uh, on it. And if you're an expert, you can even contribute by proposing a, a tutorials to, to be added in, uh, inside it. Yeah, so... So I think that's it. So thank you, everyone. Do we have any other question or we don't have? A, so I, I got one uh, from Iman. One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we always talk about Shores, Grovers, Deutsche. Deutsche yeah, yeah. Uh, I, answer, I answered. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed yeah, you. I, I just said that uh, that uh, there's a, there's an archive paper with a library of many many algorithms. We also I didn't say, but inside the archive papers. You will also find the Qiskit implementation uh, for a given algorithm, mm. uh, like for instance, uh, like for instance here. I think this is the one for maybe for teleportation. Uh, yeah, you have uh, you have everything to implement the algorithms. Like here, you see, this is the circuit for the what we call the Dutch uh, the Dutch Sosa uh, quantum algorithm for uh, checking if a function is uh, is odd or even, and every and so you have everything inside this paper, and much more here in terms of coding uh, with this document. Let me add one more, uh, if I may, to that. Um, yeah. uh, these things called uh, tensor networks. I, I saw a presentation on them about two weeks ago, but that's a, a library. Um, as well, it's a technique as well as a library from yeah. from so, Google. I don't. Uh, I don't think tensor networks, quantum tensor network, which is a field of study by itself, 
I'm not that sure that it's really related to TensorFlow quantum. Uh, oh, it's not. Yeah, they, they separated from TensorFlow for sure, yeah. but it is a machine learning quantum oriented uh, yeah. technique. Yeah, tensor network is more like cluster states in, a, in quantum optics, if you know it. Um, it's not really, I think, uh, something that you can transpose with, uh, that you can apply with the quantum circuits. But I, I'm not at all an expert of tensor networks. I, I maybe read one or two papers in my career on it, uh, but no more. That was something fun to research. Hey, man, it's getting late. I think we got to get you, uh, what's it, 11 o'clock your uh, time. It was my pleasure. All right. Well, thank you. On behalf of everybody, you had half the crew here. Uh, you got some really dedicated fans. So um, they're still here. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Let me remind folks. Uh, oh, I did want to say one thing, by the way. Uh, speaking of Kiskit, IBM, the IBM Challenge, which many of you had heard about a week or two ago, uh, today at noon, IBM in their Kiskit YouTube channel. Uh, and if you need the details, look at the Quantum Palooza page at the bottom now because it's a past event. Uh, but in their live event today at noon, New York time, uh, they walk through all the solutions uh, for <clears throat> the four IBM Kiskit challenges. So if any of you had participated in that um, challenge, and I think they said the, ch the challenge pages are still open if you want to play with it, uh, you know, that's a good, uh, good uh, use of your time if you're interested in the, in the Kiskit space. Uh, four challenges basically uh, increase in complexity from beginner to something rather sophisticated. Anyway, um, enough of that. Thanks, folks. We'll see you on Friday. Don't forget, it's three hours earlier on Friday. That's 12 o'clock yeah. um, uh, Eastern time. Yeah, Any last? I'm, Go I'm ahead. not sure it would be for an hour on Friday because I don't have uh, much slide on the hardware. Just a few oh. of them. and. Uh, and then I will uh, I will explain uh, I will give a little bit more information on the quantum industry and uh, what's going on with uh, financial initiatives. Cool. So, so that's for Friday. Okay. Uh, get your questions prepared, folks. Uh, Bruno, thank you. That's yeah. it for today, everybody. Thank Appreciate you, the time on your for your part and for everybody hanging in there for uh, two hours uh, of quantum fun. Uh, take a break, everybody, and. We'll see you at a minimum on Friday. Yeah. See you later. Goodbye. Ciao. Ciao.